Good evening, graphic novel fans. All right. Is this actually working? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I'm Calvin Reed. As you said, senior news editor of Publishers Weekly. Uh, uh, I cover comics and graphic novels in the book trade. Uh, I also am the co-host of More to Come, a weekly podcast on comics and graphic and novel publishing, along with my co-host, Heidi the Beat McDonald. If you don't know about Heidi, uh, then you should. Best comic book reporter on the planet. Um, not just me saying it. Um, her mother says it too, but but you can look around. Yeah, these guys would agree with me. And our other co-host is is um, Kate Fitzsimmons. She's our podcast producer. We're every week. We're on every week. And I think I've interviewed almost all of you. Not you. We'll have to get you on more to come to. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to talk about graphic nonfiction. You know, for a minute, let's talk also about this word to nonfiction graphic novels. Now we all know here in the book world that a novel is not nonfiction. The, but this is sort of, you know, part of the, uh, the, the, the developmental phase of this medium as it, you know, as it moves, particularly in North America, to a wider audience with, with more genres and more ways of telling stories. Um, I, for many years, I would twist myself into knots when I was writing to avoid seeing nonfiction graphic <laughs> novel. I used to did hate graphic novel, too. Yeah. But, you know, I've given up on that. You know, you say it, people know what you're talking about. And what more can you ask for than that, <laughs> the English language? But, but what we are talking about is how, how comics, how comics have been able to um, uh, move into the nonfiction category, how a wide range of nonfiction, when we're, and we're talking uh, and reflected up here on our panel today, memoir and, and uh, what you might call more, uh, more specifically journalism um, and, and just sort of nonfiction as a storytelling medium. We're going to talk about all of this. Um, I mean, we've introduced our panel to some degree, but I'm going to go over it again just so that everybody knows what's up. We'll start with Josh. Now, Josh is the author of, among other things, Andy New Orleans after the deluge, which we're going to be talking quite a bit about today. But he's done many other things. He's also done um, The Influencing Machine with Barbara Gladstone, which is really a, a wonderful history of journalism and media. Um, uh, a Few Perfect Hours, which is, I guess, is a travel log with your wife. Well, was a uh, wife now. Was she at the time of the, the book? When we did the book, we were married. When we went traveling, we were trying to go off. Titans of Finance, um, Vagabonds, uh, and actually Terms of Service, which is a more recent work uh, that looks at um, the digital culture, surveillance, and how our data is used. Actually, it's very timely now. You should be waving that book around uh, right now, the discussion that uh, uh, is going on around uh, uh, Facebook and now how our data is used. Uh, Julia Alexeva. Yes. I got it. Um, uh, well, I, I know primarily about Soviet Daughter, uh, Graphic Revolution. Uh, I also know about your publisher, Microcosm, which I think is a very interesting publisher, which we'll ask you more about later. But it's really a, a, a really wonderful uh, example of, I guess, dual memoir. I mean, how you and your great-grandmother's life and how you play them off each other. And we're going to talk about that much more. And, of course, Kyle Baker, the man, um, <laughs> you know, Nat Turner, uh, really a just a powerful piece of myth making. I mean it's not he's not a myth but he had has become almost like one. In, you, in one sense your book brings him down to earth but also uh, really delineates a guy that's really bigger that kind of really got a calling mm -hmm. to kick ass uh, yeah. for want of a better way to describe it. So um, uh, just to, that's, that's my so called fuller introduction of our panelists. Uh, but what we have now, we come from a time when um, Hello. this medium was usually associated with funnies, with scientific, with uh, science fiction, with fantastic imaginary adventures. Now we're based on a broad range of works from that focus on serious journalism to personal memoir to how-to books. I mean, we really just scratched the surface. And what better place to have this panel than in the midst of this exhibition here, the Marsh Trilogy, uh, in many ways, we can look to it as just where comics and comics nonfiction has come to. Uh, this work, a powerful work of American history, that does all the things that great comics do. It's dynamic, it's great storytelling, it's powerful, it's emotional, it's an adventure. It's all true. It's all true, and it's probably one of the greatest stories you can tell about this country. So, 
let's talk with uh, our panelists. Uh, we're going to see how their, their work ties into all of my jabbering here. Um, I'm going to, you know, we're going to go alphabetically. Um, and we're going to start with Julia. Now, uh, my first question to all is, is really going to be the same. I want them, you know, to start off talking about what inspired this work, these works that we're focusing on, in your case, Sophia Daughter, uh, and how you got it to market, how you got it to readers. I mean, we're going to, I, I, I'm really curious about the creative work, but also how you get it, you know, how you get in front of readers. So we'll start with Julia. Great. Um, is there a way to put up the yes. cover? Just yes. make it a little... Yes, all right, thank you. Um, so, Sovia Daughter is based on the real-life memoirs of my great-grandmother um, growing up in the Soviet Union. So when she died in 2010, my family uncovered that she had written um, these memoirs of her time, um, and she had been writing them for what seemed like dozens of years. We kind of knew in the back of, uh, back of our minds kind of that she had, was writing something about her life, but we didn't know to what extent, um, just to what extent she was, she was fulfilling that, that she was actually writing almost daily about her life. Um, and so after she died, we found these memoirs, and I thought, th and having read them, I thought they were just absolutely incredible because they encapsulated so many important moments in Soviet history. So she actually described her experiences with the Bolshevik Revolution, even though she was only seven at the time that this happened, but her memory was just so extraordinary. Um, so she described the Bolshevik Revolution, she talked about the Civil War, um, Stalinism, and sort of the height of the purges in the late 30s. Every Everything that I was reading about in college and in grad school, and at the time I was reading these, I was a grad student, everything sort of fell into place, and I realized just how striking her story was in relation to learning about world history and how important it would be um, for, that I, how important I thought it would be for specifically an American audience to really understand what it must have felt like to live in the Soviet Union. Um, so many years after it all happened, and many years after the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, so when I, after I read the the memoirs, I immediately had the idea of a graphic novel in my head. I, th I thought, this needs imagery. This would be so good if people could read it. You know, I just immediately thought it would make a really interesting narrative. I, oh, I couldn't have written it better myself. One, because I'm not good at writing fiction. Um, so even if I, even if I could though, even if I could write the best fiction work, I I just think her story was so much more incredible than anything I could have made up. Um, so that was the idea I had, and I immediately went about trying to do it, and it took four ever to find a publisher for me um, because I was completely unknown. Uh, I made a couple of zines that I passed around, nothing published officially, but me being completely insane, um, decided my first major project was going to be uh, a 200-page graphic novel. That was my first project. And so I took, uh, I saved up $13,000 for my measly grad student paycheck um, and lived in Brooklyn uh, for a year on $13,000, which is very difficult. Um, <laughs> I lived... That's magic. Yeah. Uh, I had really weird roommate situations. It was w bizarre. I would not do it again. Uh, my life was a shambles. But the book happened, and it, you know, I basically sent these cold call emails to every publisher I could think of. I went to um, all of the comic shops in New York and Chicago, because those are the two cities where I was based. Um, I'm from Chicago, and I looked at all of the books in each comic shop that were similar to what I wanted to do. And then I wrote down those publishers, and then I emailed them. And no one responded except Microcosm. <laughs> so I was lucky in that sense that I found anyone, because I didn't have an agent. I had tried to find an agent and was disheartened by how d difficult it was and decided it, you know, stupidly wasn't worth my time. I now sort of regret this, but basically I was like a, like a lone cowboy sitting on my computer writing these terrifying emails to people um, for hours a day. Uh, like t 10. There aren't that many comics public. There weren't at least five, you know, five years ago. So I got, um, well, most of them weren't rejections. Most of them were just... S silence, like radio silence, you know. Um, 
even people I knew, you know, that I had met at, at Comics Fest and try, had a rapport with, was it was just not happening. Um, but Microcosm decided to, you know, take take a leap of faith, really. And at that point, I had already finished the book, so um, it I think it worked out. And you know, it there we'll talk about this later. But there are a lot of difficulties with independent presses just um, competing with the mainstream market. Um, it's still not incredibly easy, and it's not easy at all. But uh, I. In that sense, I was lucky that anyone responded to me, and um, and they've been really great to work with. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you? What What was your motivation for creating Nectar? Um, and, and and how did you get published? Well, I wish I could remember the uh, what. Oh, I know the reason I got. The, I read there was two pages in the there were two pages in the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X. Where he talks about Nat Turner, because I guess his father or somebody admired Nat Turner. His father was a Garviate also. But it, like, he had this little backstory in the book somewhere about his father. Mm -hmm. And so it had this two page synopsis of the Nat Turner story. And just reading those two pages, it, it, it had all the elements that I look for for a good comic book. Uh, you know, a comic book, had, it, it, this is my opinion, of course, but comic book. I think it needs to be visually stimulating in some way. You know, so you have to have some kind of interesting world or dragons or action or something like that. And you know, uh, this story had built in suspense because he had gotten away with it and he was hiding out in the woods. And there was, it was, you know, it had a good story. A uh, big problem with with nonfiction is you can't change the ending. Yes, yes. You know, I did a King David. I did a King David book and, and years ago. The ending. Yes. I, well, I did a King David book, and the, the the guy died of old age, which is like the worst ending, for the worst story ever. You know, but you can't change it. But this had everything. You know, with the guy. It's. It, you know, it had all the elements, and it like sure. it's like dudes with swords riding on horses, and all and that it, kind of stuff. Of course, the topic is the it's kind of in some ways it's the great undercurrent uh, of of American racial consciousness. Well, the other fascinating thing to me yeah. was that it had not been done to death. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like if I wanted to do a book about like a the re black, a black uprising. Well, like I read it in the Mal I read it in the Malcolm X book. The, the, yeah. the of the white majority. Well, I read it in the Malcolm <laughs> X book, which is you know one of my favorite books, and that Malcolm X story has been done to death. There's like sure. movies about the guy, books about the guy, books about the movies. You know, it's uh, same thing with Dr. King or a lot of these things, and it was rare that you'd find something that had that much name recognition. Yeah, because one thing I've just known from. I've been doing this for 30 years. Sure. Uh, I did a Classics Illustrated very early on, and the books sold very well because they had a built-in audience. If people weren't buying it because it was you, it was because they're Alice in Wonderland, so they would Google Alice. So that's something I knew about books sure. was that if you pick a topic, people look for a topic, whether it's you know, how to make money on the Internet or yeah. how to drive a car or you know, any of these kind of things. Yeah, you know, Alice in Wonderland was just getting hits because of that. So Nat Turner is a, a popular, he's a well-known guy, but there were no books. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's very little in... Other than the Bill Starr novel? Yeah, I'm just, there's very little in the, in, in the popular culture. Like yeah. I said, if I, if I want to hear about Martin Luther King, I can find a bunch of big-budget movies and TV shows and, you know, with major stars like, you know, Denzel Washington, Paul Winfield, you know, whoever. Yeah. And... Uh, so it's, it's rare that you had something like this was unexplored. And I decided to publish it myself because I, I guess Eddie Campbell talked me into publishing. Now, let me just yeah. say, I don't know if I could set it up. I mean, you've had, you, you have a long and very career in comics publishing. Yeah, yeah. You've done it all. Yeah, and animation. You Marvel, yeah. DC, yeah. anything. You're I do a lot of Disney animation. crap, yeah. Um, you, you, you're kind of a pioneer in the yeah. self-publishing thing. I guess, was, was Nat Turner the first, first time you did that? So it was either that or Baker's. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to talk about yeah. that. So, but you could have, I mean, did, did no one want to publish this? It wasn't that. I knew how the business worked. Yeah. I had done, I, to give you some example, uh, like I was not happy with, I had done a King David book earlier. And there was a lot of corporate meddling in that. And mm -hmm. again, I was like, it, everybody knows the story. And <laughs> no, seriously, I, yeah. I went to this uh, Ridley Scott Moses movie a couple of years ago. And like he doesn't have the burning bush, and you're like, what? You know, <laughs> there's some things you're looking yeah, for. Yeah. You know, if I go to a Lone Ranger movie and there's no Tonto, or yeah. you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. of course. That's you yeah. think you know what you bought a ticket to. Sure. These are archetypes. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. So, so 
I had done the King David thing, and they, they tinkered with it. And then I had done an animated film. I had just pitched it to somebody of Noah's Ark. I talked to a producer. It's Noah's Ark, but the animals can talk. You know, it's like at this. They said that's great. I turned in the first draft, and they say, "Does everybody have to drown?" Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> you know, but once you've taken the money, and then they can do whatever the hell they, you know. And I, I like you say, I work for Disney and yeah. whatever. The, and so I'm used to them just tinkering with crap. And I don't put up a fight because I'm I'm there for the money. So if yeah, yeah I've written Superman stories where they they all change the ending and change this and that, and TV shows where they oh we don't want that joke and. It's so you're trying to escape from that. So well, I just knew how this would go. Yeah. Like, again, you, when you bring in a Noah's Ark thing and they're they're ob- objecting to the drowning, or the other note was God seems kind of mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, did you read the book? Old Testament. No, you know what I mean. It's, He's mean. For me, it's, whenever I see something that I'm used to, like Shakespeare or, or Sherlock Holmes or something, you, you know what I mean. If, yes, if I'm going to Sherlock yes. Holmes, it's it's got what's in it. Yeah, you know, whether it's right or you know, you know what I mean. You wouldn't take Rosencrantz and Guildenstern out of Shakespeare, <laughs> you know. Maybe Hollywood. Well, I'm be. saying you could, you should, <laughs> okay, but yeah. but it's there and it's yeah. what you expect to see when you're going in. So and you expect Romeo and Juliet to die, you know. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> yes. You know, you go to a Jesus movie, he yeah. dies at the end. You know that's going to happen. So it was, <laughs> I, I didn't. I, I talk about my sister is a librarian, yeah. and uh, she had said that this is a long time ago. Whenever the hell I did this book, I don't remember now. But she had said that comic books were the most stolen books in her library. No, seriously. And yeah. I said, well, that, that's great. That's, the kids are reading some market that, research. Yeah, yeah. the kids are actually interested in anything. Yeah. And they, they're desperate to get kids to read anything. You know, and I got four kids. So it's the same thing as, you know, when I found out my daughter was, she was very young, she was reading Stephen King. I was like, I don't know if she should be right. Let's read Stephen. I'm like, she's reading something. You know, let her read it. So I said, you know, do you have any educational mm-hmm. comic books? And she said, oh, no, we're just, you know, it's just Archie and Superman yeah. and that kind of thing. And I said, well, what if somebody did an educational book? She said, oh, I, I would definitely buy that for my library. And so that was, the, the other funny thing about the Nat Turner thing was, uh, you know, I'm always working on a bunch of ideas at the same time. And you run into somebody and, you know, they say, you know, what are you working on? And he says, oh, I've got a detective story and I've got a cowboy thing and da 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 And I always say, Nat Turner... And, the funny thing was, every black person would say, that's the greatest idea ever. I can't wait to see the book. And every white person would say, who's Nat Turner? <laughs> and I said, wow, that's really, again, it's just interesting to see something like that. That that's, yeah. uh, Somebody that famous that is not, like I say, has just not been exploited yeah. to death. So that um, was one reason that uh, you attracted you to do a book about it. Well, because I wanted to start my own company. And, mm-hmm. and I just think, just from a business standpoint, you don't want to compete with the big guys. You know, I, if I came up with a superhero or something like that, that I'm competing against Spider-Man or Batman. or yeah. I'm not going to win. I'm not, you know, if I put out a science fiction thing, you know, Star Trek's going to kill me. But nobody wanted this business. So I, I just knew that there'd be no competition and maybe I could carve out a niche for myself. And, and you turned out to I actually bad. did. Yeah, it took yeah. Her about 10 years, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm curious because you, you did a your your first printing of it, didn't you sell out of them? It... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, the first printing it did better than expected, and all that kind of stuff. And I eventually sold it to Harry Abrams because yeah. I, I was spending too much time at the post office. So sure, I, yeah. I didn't really <laughs> want to be doing yeah. that stuff. All right, well, and I still spent too much time doing that. We're going to return yeah. to this to, to yeah. your your publishing hijinks. <laughs> uh, but first, we're going to go to Josh uh, to talk about uh, AD New Orleans and. New Orleans and Katrina. Yes, so um, <clears throat> so the backstory for that book was that uh, I actually was um, was here in New York when Hurricane Katrina hit, and was very affected by what I saw happening on the television screens and the radio. And I, I'm sure, like a lot of you who were there and saw it, was very upset by what I was seeing and the way that. Um, the various authorities did not seem to be uh, responding and helping the people who were who were in such a desperate situation. So I ended up volunteering with the Red Cross, and uh, I ended up getting trained in disaster response and was sent down to Biloxi, Mississippi, um, about 90 miles outside of uh, New Orleans, and worked for um, worked for the Red Cross. Uh, basically for about a month, um, delivering fresh food to people who were still rebuilding after the storm and, and trying to get their lives back in order. Um, so that experience really had 
was not leading into a comic. It was really just like a, a pure response as someone who had the ability to go and do something like that. Um, and it was very impactful. And I ended up writing about, uh, I was blogging. Uh, blogs are these things that people used to have um, before Twitter and Facebook. Um, and I blogged a lot about my experiences down there. I met a lot of folks and people who I, I uh, served in that area and other Red Cross volunteers, et cetera. And, um, then I, I collected that book and it got written up somewhere. And anyway, this website, Smith Magazine, Larry Smith, the editor, found out about me. Jeff Newell, who was an editor there, who's in peripherally in comics as well, um, they thought uh, that why don't I take this experience that I had had um, as someone who had been embedded in the Katrina experience and do a journalistic treatment of the Katrina story, um, not using my own experiences at all, but like now acting as a journalist. So they had already had some success online. They had, they had serialized a comic called Shooting War, um, illustrated by Dan Goldman, and they had had a lot of press from that. This was back 2006, I think, when the internet was still kind of new. And... Um, and uh, the book then got published by a, by a real book publisher, and so they were like, hey, you know, you, we, why don't you do this? We can't pay you much, but maybe if it does well, could lead to um, some kind of book deal. And it was exciting for me to sort of take that background experience I had had as, uh, in, in New Orleans and with, with the experience of Katrina um, and then go out and, and like take on a big project like that because I had written um, nonfiction my whole comics career, but I'd never really worked as a journalist, but I very deeply engaged with journalism and the news, and I used to work at The Nation magazine, and so on and so forth. So um, I took this on, and with the help of Larry Smith, I went down to New Orleans, um, interviewed a bunch of people. We met all sorts of people who'd had various experiences, and there were like some iconic experience, some archetypal experiences that you read about any time you read about or hear about hurricanes. And same thing with Maria and, and, and the one that hit Houston and Puerto Rico. You, knew, hear, you hear stories of displacement, flooding, people barely escaping, losing everything that they own, um, having to start all over again, uh, social conflicts that happen because of um, lack of resources, all of these sorts of things, government failures. So I was looking, I immediately thought I need to find people who've had, you know, each of these various experiences, but I also wanted to have a group of people who had, who, who came from a diverse background as well. So we were looking for black people, white people, people in between, <laughs> old people, young people, poor people, people who hadn't been affected at all by the storm, who lived in the, in the higher areas. Um, and amazingly, with seven people, we found like a really diverse group. Um, and uh, yeah, it was mainly a process of going down there, interviewing them, taking a lot of photographs, a lot of reference images. Um, and then I just started literally drawing uh, writing, researching, writing, and drawing a chapter at a time. It would go post it up at the end of every month, be published, and then I would go back to work re researching, writing, reporting, drawing, the whole thing for the next chapter. And I was building the book along the way with a vague idea of sort of how I wanted it to all play out. And uh, it ended up getting a lot of press and um, yeah, was was highly sought after. I got an agent. Um, Pantheon offered uh, what was it called? It was like a one like take it or leave it deal this weekend only. You know, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So it was my first experience with that kind of thing. Yes, um, and Pantheon to me was sort of the perfect publisher. Was the book complete? <clears throat> no, it was. I mean, the the web project was basically done, the web version of it, but it needed a lot of filling out for the uh, for the print edition. Um, and one of the things that was important to me, um, actually, in terms of reading and, and access, was that since the version on Smith was free and available for anybody without a paywall, I wanted to make sure that that continued to be the case moving forward. And the publisher in Random House was a little bit, you know, annoyed about that because they thought that it might cut into sales, but I did, it did not prove on into it all. Revolution where uh, yeah. were all terrified that online uh, editions of, of books would somehow interfere with sales, but it actually works the exact opposite way. Yeah. 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 It brings more readers to the print book. A hundred percent. So. True? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, leaving, I mean, and we're seeing it more and more now. I mean, Smith Magazine was an interesting platform for a lot of storytellers uh, at one time, uh, but really, um, more and more, what we what we have found over time 
is that having an early version, that's always good to sort of have some added value to whatever you do in the print copy, to have some new material in the print version. But very often that online version is the best signpost to send readers to the print version because surprise, surprise, people like print books. You know, they might yeah. they like to sample it online, but when they actually want to read the book, they want the thing in their hands. Yeah, so. and just an addendum to that, um, I recently, I don't know, about a year ago, I was contacted by a high school teacher at a school in Wisconsin or something, and they had been, they, they don't have the money to buy books for everybody in the classroom, but they've been teaching the book, the AD, to their students and wanted to continue doing that. And because uh, that whole thing happened with um, the server, the, the, the free image provider service that like all of a sudden just decided to start charging everybody and everybody's images died all over the web. I can't remember the name. Photo bucket. Photo bucket. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So Photo Bucket just changed their terms one day and all these free images just got replaced yeah. with a sign saying you pay yeah. us and we'll put this back up. So I went laborious, so basically AD disappeared because yeah. of that. So I went back in and spent like, you know, a, a day going and, and reposting all those images at another server to make sure that it would be available. Because again, I just really believe that it's important that people read this story in whatever format sure. they can, whether they can pay for it or not, so. Sure. Um. So, and at the time, you know, well, Pantheon continues. Obviously, Pantheon is a, is a very distinguished literary imprint at Random House. And uh, they, uh, I think they were the first to publish Mouse. Uh, so you're in good company. Yeah. Uh, when Absolutely. you were to be published by Pantheon. Um, uh, did they have problems marketing, marketing it? Um, I mean, I guess they did because the book had gotten so much attention. It got a lot of media attention. Yeah, well, again, uh, they, they always are short-sighted short about this. They didn't want to... Um, I, we thought it had a lot of potential for the academic market, but Pantheon didn't want to pay to, to have somebody write a, te a teacher's guide to it. So my wife actually volunteered. <laughs> she has a background in education the and comics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have been like $300 or something. Yeah. And now the book has been used in colleges and universities yeah. all over the world. And so, and then that teacher's edition has been heavily used. So. It's hard to believe that a publisher like Pantheon, too. But there you have it. Yep. Uh, all right. We've, uh, got, we've got a teacher's edition. There, there you go. go. There <laughs> um, all right. Well, you know what? Um, Maybe we can talk a little bit about I mean, some of your creative choices. Let's jump back to Julia. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you put this together. I mean, how you made, because your book is a series, uh, it alternates between your life and your relationship uh, with your great grandmother. But really, as you put it, it really is this incredible journey through the 20th century through some of the most, you know, iconic moments uh, of the 20th century. So, and uh, what I was fascinated uh, in the book about, uh, in particular, was uh, the lives of women. Your great-grandmother seemed to have a pretty free life yeah. in many ways. Uh, divorce, working, um, in ways that perhaps we don't think women actually, the option women had uh, at that time. So, how did you bring all this material together? Right. With difficulty. <laughs> but also with a lot of enjoyment, honestly. Um, I love, I mean, I'm an academic. I love digging through archives and um, researching as much visual material as I could. Um, so I had her memoir, but then I also had all of the all of this history of film and the visual arts and everything that was going on in the world. I was lucky because I, w I was also researching for my academic career um, the Soviet 1920s was something that I, that one of the re like regions and histories that I researched. So I already had all of this material and it was, you know, kind of more of a pleasure to go to the library and to like look up more sources. Um, but every page, I mean, this page is an exception because this is one of the, the pages in the book that is more from my perspective. So about 80% of the book, a little, a little more than 80% is um, my kind of creation or um, version of my great-grandmother's memoir. So that's straight from her voice, um, and I'm supplying the imagery, but then about, you know, 20%, a little less than 20% is my, sort of my own narrative, and um, why I decided to combine her memoir and sort of my own memoir 
um, not like a full memoir, but like a taste of a memoir, um, was that I wanted to convey a sense of connection between our two generations. So she was over, she was, I think, 78 years older than me, and yet I've always felt such a strong connection with her, way more than any other member in my family, way more than my mother, way more than my grandmother. So my family's a bit of a matriarchy, and I really felt this, like, extreme bond in our personalities, just the kind of people we were. Um, and, you know, as everyone is, we were both shaped by our historical periods, what we've, you know, experienced growing up and what's happening historically around us, and something in history, I think, just shaped the two of us to be rather similar in personality. Um, and actually, the more people I talk to about the book, the more this seems to be actually pretty common, that other members of my generation of millennials seem to be way closer to their, either their grandparents or their grandparents in terms of um, how free they would want to live their, li their lives. You know, there's like this, this jump over the boomer generation and into like what is considered the great generation. So... After I completed the book, suddenly all my friends were coming to me saying, like, you know, you're completely right. I was so much closer to all of these people in my family who are 70, 80, 90 years old. And there's something there. Um, so I wanted to really show that bond between us. So um, I call them interludes. So every chapter is divided by these interludes that are my, um, from my perspective, and usually there's like a thread of something happening in my great grandmother's life that I'm like mirror is somehow mirrored or reflected in in a kind of weird crooked way in my own life. So I wanted to sort of see how um, maybe a very different historical situation could affect us weirdly in the same way, or a similar you know historical situation can affect us in different ways. Um, either way, I wanted to show that tie. Um, but then the actual production in terms of the creative, uh, the creative side of things, um, it took me a long time to figure out the style that I wanted to work with. Each of my, um, my artistic works it looks very, very, very different. Um, they, you know, generally figurative, you know, real, realism in some way, but I didn't have like a, like a, already a token style that a lot of people say, like, like Lucy Nisley, like it's her style, every book is in her style. And I didn't have that. And I thought that every book, um, every you know, zine or mini comic that I did had its own necessity. Like there's something about the story that requires drawing it in a very specific way. And so I thought a long time about how to do that. And there's like a longer story involved, uh, more involved that explains why I decided to choose the style I did. Um, but I wanted it to feel like looking at an old crinkled photograph, you know, that like texture, which is really different from looking at like a digital photograph, you know, there's like this feel of like, di of, of um, imperfections in, in this print, you know, um, pl places where it was like scratched off a little bit. Um, so I thought that a, like an ink wash style that's not quite perfected, I leave a couple of the weird angular lines in there would produce that feeling that I thought was necessary in order to produce a really strong emotional affect like from the reader so I wanted the actual drawing to produce the emotional effect more so than the actual words on the page so hopefully it succeeded now your background you you grew up in the US um, I was born in the USSR mm -hmm. and moved um, as a refugee to mm -hmm. Chicago in 92 with all of my family mm -hmm. including my great-grandmother so we all did the mess you know the immigration the exodus uh, yeah. The mass exodus of Soviet Jews uh, leaving um, leaving the Soviet Union once it had collapsed. Like we were in that that late wave, and so we all settled in Chicago. So I like like learned to become an American like slowly. <laughs> um, but then my family, like one of the reasons that I was able to communicate and read her memoirs, which were entirely in Russian, um, was because my 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 life at home was mini USSR. Like, it was a recreation of a Soviet household. Like, it was a Soviet household. We, everyone spoke Russian all the time. They were totally non-assimilated. So it was this weird double life where I would go to school and I would speak English and then, like, suddenly there would be, like, a wall. I would go in and now, now I'm in the Soviet Union. Here we are. We are eating only Russian food. We are only speaking Russian. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was really bizarre. But thank, I guess, thankfully, I was able to... Um, understand better, like the experiences of my great grandmother, because of that. So. And, and and your influences uh, from comics, um, uh, what what are they? 
many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, especially... So a few signatures. Yeah, they, well, certainly, I mean, the, the absolute first book that I thought, oh, maybe this is something I would want to do um, was obviously Mouse, um, mm-hmm. and especially in terms of the uh, um, him writing his father's memoir, so, but also the writing of the memoirs in itself, a memorializing process and therapeutic in its own way. Um, so it's certainly Mouse, um, Alison Bechdel, uh, Marjan Satrepi, um, uh, Uli Lust, who I read actually at the very, very end of my, um, uh, as I was finishing this book. The book, book uh, Tomorrow Will Maybe Be the Last Day of the, the Rest of Your Life, which is a really extraordinary book. Really incredible, yeah. yeah. And I was also influenced by, um, so one of the things I study is Japanese film and literature and art, and um, I, as I was writing the book in terms of form, I was thinking a lot about um, girls manga or shoujo manga um, in terms of the layout of the page. So the way that I, I'm sure many of you already know that uh, manga is separated it generally. There are more categories than this into boys and girls manga, shonen and sho- shoujo. And shoujo manga is very expressive formally. Um, so maybe not necessarily content-wise, but sometimes like it's often about love and about relationships and magic and magic girls and things like that, but often they would have a page that's just roses, you know, scattered around, or like stars, and like things are in a crazy layout, and the layout is more intuitive, it's not like blocky, Um, there are very few lines, um, separating panels, a lot of leads, um, and I loved the like it, how so much of shoujo manga was about emotional expression versus like a narrative, um, like a more you know a narrative based on events happening. So I was definitely influenced by a lot of, of that as well. All right, we're going to jump to Kyle. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm curious about the the creative choices you made around. Nat turn. I mean, I mean, as you said before, it, you, you, we know what the story is. We know how it how it ended. But but you, you know, I mean, most of the book is wordless. Yeah. Um, but at a certain point, the actual confessions of Nat Turner. Uh, for those who may not know, he I mean he he has a, a writ. The, uh, there's a confession of Nat Turner, which is the William Styron novel. But there's, the confessions actually exist. Um, what a guy by the name of Thomas Gray wrote them down mm-hmm. in right. in. His cell before it was hung. Right. So, it, it, what, what, how did you decide to craft the book? How did you decide? Uh, what were your well, because, things were on your mind? Because I was specifically looking at the educational market, I felt that it had to be accurate. It had to be, you can't teach something in school if, if I start making stuff up. But it was also, uh, one thing I found strange about this particular story was that. People always felt it was controversial. Oh, yeah? okay. People always felt would tell me they felt it was a controversial story, which was I found odd because the last time I checked, we were all against slavery, and we could all <laughs> kind of agree. You know, you know, I mean, we we just had Passover just now, and you know, yeah, everybody you agrees. Oh, okay, Moses, he freed the slaves. Yes, what a guy. Okay, he killed a bunch of kids, but hey, what the hell? You know, he's a good guy. You know, and and uh, I. So I would think that it would be less of a controversy that some guy would be against slavery, yeah. and yet it still was. And what I found in, in doing research... The form of his protest is what maybe intimidates well, people. Well, it was also... When, 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 uh, what I found was that, you know, looking at what had, been, what had gone before, like the Styron thing, because it's such an old story and it's hard to find info, uh, people would editorialize a bit. And that's the stuff people are, are arguing with. Uh, it... it my goal in this was to have leave people nothing to argue with. Like uh, uh, some negative criticism I've, I've read of the book were that uh, they couldn't really see my uh, my opinion on very many pages. And I was like, I didn't want to give my opinion. This is what happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about doing some uh, war stories with the uh, with the military, mm. and uh, same idea. I don't have to be for or against. The Battle of Midway. I, I, all I got to do is just yeah. say, "Well, here's what the way it was. Here's the way it went. That really happened. This guy got hanged. So, you know, I don't see what the problem is." Well, what about <laughs> the intro to the book, which is very much the lead up is starts in Africa. Yeah, so yeah. Well, that's kind of it. Well, the, well no, everything, no, everything I mm-hmm. did research of, I, I did a ton of research, and everything that's in the book actually happened to somebody. Yes, we're yes. not sure. 
But but for example, they, they, uh, the people being uh, fed from a trough sure. was actually, I got that out of uh, Frederick Douglass' yeah. autobiography. And I think I might have even given them some credit in that. Um, and then there was also some quotes from a, a slave trader. So yeah. it wasn't, again, not my opinion yeah. that this happened. This guy actually said, here's how we treated the slaves. Here's what we did to them. And same thing, uh, there's a lot of debate as, of, as to whether or not Turner actually dictated that confession. Yeah, yeah. But I said, you, you'll take it up with the author. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm sticking <laughs> yeah. with the official government sure. document. This is the official government account of what happened. I'm off the hook. Yeah. You know, and I just, and so, like, for example, a baby being eaten by a shark, that's actually a true story from, some, from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, the WPA, uh, had done interviews with the surviving slaves. Uh-huh. That was part of the uh, I'm blanking FDR. Yeah, FDR right, sure. thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They had talked to, you know, the remaining... There were oral history. Right, the oral and history. The, and they, yeah. These guys were about 100 years old, you know, at this point. And they, they, I just would go through it and I would... I was specifically looking for awful stuff. I was basically <laughs> yes. structuring it like a... a one, of, one of the models for this was uh, In Cold Blood. Mm-hmm. Where... If you've ever read In Cold Blood, the people, the protagonists are just, they, they do something awful, but you get it because he gets into their head. Or, or um, Dostoevsky, it's a mm-hmm. work of fiction, a crime and punishment, but you read that thing and you get into the guy's head and you're like, okay, I can kind of see why he did that. So it was that kind of thing. It's like, you know, if somebody kidnapped my mother and raped her and sold my kids, I, I, I'd probably have a thing or two to say about yeah. it, you know. Yeah. With and, an axe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so well, yeah. I mean, that, 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 those are your options. I mean, hey, you know, and, and those were the options vote. he had. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we get to vote. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, as we we, we were talking, oh, somebody yeah, saying, please, sorry, go uh, So the reason it was silent was that when I listened to those tapes, it, it's all dialect. You know, the, the, all the slaves are uneducated, and so the stuff's kind of hard to pick up. And and I just felt I'm not Mark Twain. Who's great at dialect, and I felt the dialect would just be distracting mm-hmm. and hard to follow and hard. To, and again, uh, part of my goal with designing this book was to give you nothing to push back against. You know, and it's like when we all leave here, we're going to go home and tell people how this thing went, mm-hmm. and you're going to get twenty different stories. Mm-hmm. But if there's a photograph of it. We're all on the same page. That's what you were wearing, and that's where you were sitting, that's what you were doing. You, you know what? I, can, sure. I, I, had my, I had my opinions on how, whether or not he should have handled it the way he handled it, but I, I'm staying out yeah, of it. Yeah. You know, but we can all agree. The guy got hanged. That's, that's just a fact. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he did some damage, too. Yeah. Um, um, and if he got a problem with it, he did pay for it. I mean, he yeah, got, he, well, he paid for he it. Got it hand, he, think, well, it was very interesting because happy. how you lay it out because you the, the, the most of the book is is, is wordless. Mm-hmm. Though you take us through, I mean, he had a vision of, of this. And yeah, he was. This was a calling for him. Uh, yeah, and he rallied. You know, what forty or fifty guys together, yeah, and yeah. they killed fifty five slaveholders, women, children, baby, everybody. Yeah. Well, and again, the thing that got, got kept. Yeah, coming everybody back, was white. The, the guy thought he was Moses. Yeah, and uh, I don't think any of us are going to argue about whether Moses was right. Yeah, to do what he did. Yes, he kept absolutely. a lot of people. I mean, yeah, hit those plagues. Well, but one thing we're, all, we're all like, yeah, that's a good thing. Well, one thing I do <laughs> want to talk to you about is that I mean, you talked about you really wanted this to to the book to get into schools, right? And so I'm curious, both as a self publisher or at, or with uh, Abrams, you know, have you been able to do that? Have you had any pushback? Yeah, yet? yeah. I mean, that's that's what's keeping me alive. Yeah, basically, mm-hmm. is I, 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 I've been doing this for, since the '80s, mm-hmm. since 1983. I've been doing comic books for Marvel Comics. I, I know this business inside out, and and I'm not knocking the business anymore, but you you know that something like this is not going to work in in that marketplace. You know, if you look at what sells in the comic book stores, yeah, it's it's. And I'm not knocking it because I make money off of it, but, you know, it's the Avengers and science fiction and things like that. But I bet everybody on this stage is probably doing better somewhere else, you know. Than in the comic Like, uh, you know, Raina Tegelmeyer. 
Sure. You Raina, know, Raina's, Raina's I, a bookstore I, I creature, yeah. I can't yeah. find her books anywhere in a comic book store. <laughs> you know, and she's, she's not worrying about that at all. And no, she's you not. Know? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I know exactly what you mean. She sells millions of And that was part of, of why I yeah. publish it myself, is that I know DC and Marvel, and I, here's a different example of it. Well, uh, I wanted to do a kid's book years ago. I had a cute little ideas, you know, children and doggies. <laughs> Like a Peanuts ripoff. And so I went to the, because I was at DC Comics, I went to the uh, editor, it was Joan Hilty at the time, yeah, of the sure. Scooby Doo, Powerpuff Girls, Bugs Bunny. They got a whole little yeah. section there. And I said, hey, I got a great idea. You know, it'll go great with your Powerpuff Girls and da da da. And she said, well, I'll tell you the truth. That nobody reads those books. We just do it because Warner Brothers forces us to do these books. They, they tell us, you're going to do a Scooby Doo book, you know. And uh, from, from a, Marketing standpoint, I'm like, wow, you just, you, you mean you're the only bird on earth who can't sell Scooby Doo? <laughs> Honestly, it's still like the top license in the, in the yeah, world. Sure. You know, but I just knew that they just, and, and same thing happened with Joe Cuber when he did those uh, Jewish books. Yeah, those, the great he novels. Paul, he did. And Paul, Paul Levitt said, yeah. look, this is a great book, and I'll tell you right now, we'll put it out, we'll do nothing for you. You know, we'll do it. <laughs> Cause we like but it. they were talking about the direct market. I'm just saying that that's yeah. where they are. They know that's where they were in those But they also sure. can afford to just eat money to keep you happy. I mean, I, which is fine. Well, <laughs> so that's true. Well, when yeah. we're talking about Marvel and told, DC, yeah. the rules of regular publishing don't always apply, it seems. Well, the thing about Marvel and DC, if you look at the... the, the their business model is, is wait until you die. <laughs> no, seriously. It, 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 certain people like, like uh, Will Eisner, mm-hmm. Arnold Drake... Like, you'll notice, like, right after they die, suddenly all their stuff gets developed because they're not in the room. The same thing as yeah. Dr. Seuss. Once Dr. Seuss died, I mean, he's not with Mar- Marvel DC, but whoever had yeah. him, he became a lot easier to work with once he died. <laughs> and, no, now you see, he hated Hollywood. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to make a Cat in the Hat movie. I'm not going to make yeah. a Grinch movie. I don't need the money. The minute he died, now you can see all these. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the same thing with DC. They will just wait, you know. They wait until Eisner dies, and and then they'll put out the spirit. So it's that kind of thing, though. They also have a. They they. And I love them, but <laughs> uh, this seems off topic, but it's not. That's it's, right. it's, it's, cor- it's the corporation. Years ago, there was a book called The Cult by Bernie Wrightson and uh, Jim Starlin. It was a Batman book. It was sold. It oh, yeah. sold great. When there was no Batman stuff going on, this right. was pre Dark Knight, pre yes. movies. There was nothing. Yeah. Nobody gave a damn about Batman. Bernie figured it out and figured out how to sell a Batman. Mm-hmm. It was best selling book of the year. They go back to Paul and they're like, "We got. We're going to do a sequel." And I'm like, "No." Warner Brothers says you guys are getting too popular as the Batman guys. You can do anything. Like they did that when I was working at Bugs Bunny. We wanted Billy West to be the voice, and they're like, mm-hmm. "No, he's becoming too popular as Bugs Bunny." And we don't want another male blank on our hands. You know, we'll <laughs> no, we'll let him do any other voice except for Bugs Bunny because he's doing too good at it. He had already done Space Jam. He had done a couple of commercials, and and then they did it with me with Plastic Man. I'm allowed to do any character except Plastic Man. I swear to God. <laughs> well, it's a it's a strange world. <laughs> well, no, no. I, again, it's it's if your business is creating, and I say this about Disney. Yeah. When I work at Disney, if they didn't pay the guy who drew Mickey Mouse, they're not going to pay you. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't pay the guy who made up Captain America, they're not going to pay you. They didn't pay the guy who did Bugs Bunny or well, this Superman, they're not, you know, that it's a good business model for them. And, and what, what, the you're talking about the work, yeah, what you're talking about is the work for hire model that, well, has, saying, that has driven Marvel and DC for 80 or 80 no, or 90 it's years. It's the corporate ownership of, of yes, yes, it's, yes. It's, but that's their thing. model. Yeah. Their model is that work is for hire. Yeah. That you sign away, you right. work on characters that you don't own, right? And they do whatever they want, right? To and do. that's why you have and Dark Knight movie that Frank Miller has nothing to do with. Exactly, exactly. exactly. And so, but they have. But this is pockets. a different kind you know of model. They have big pockets. They would have bought this thing. They would have published it. and They would have put it in the closet. Yeah, and they would. Yes, they would have screwed then, it up. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and they're nice enough to tell me, and they told Joe Kubert the same thing with yeah. his Yassel book, and also uh, Jew Gangster was the other one. They were just like, take it somewhere else. <laughs> but actually, we're in, a, we're in a period now where Marvel and DC, or at least DC is anyway, or they're rethinking their the whole approach to the book trade. But yeah. let's jump to, I want to jump uh, to Josh. Mm-hmm. Uh, really take a, uh, you did talk a little bit about your creative uh, choices that you made. But I, I, I am curious how you worked with Pantheon 
it sounds like you had some, some issues with getting this book to the readers that would be interested in it. Um, I mean, you told us a little bit about how you found the people, or did you? Did you talk about how you found the various people that you um, profiled in AD New Orleans? Um, yeah, I talked a little bit about it. I don't know how much people want to know the nitty two. gritty. How, how did you find them? Yeah. Did, did they come to you? or No. Um, gosh, what? so uh, one guy, that, there's a guy who um, in the book, Leo, uh, he's, a, he's a young guy who lives in Mid-City area who's like a zine publisher and uh, a comic book fan. Oh, yes, and he had the thousands he of lost all. He lost 15,000 comics in the flood and he became sort of a, 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 a cause celeb for a while because it was written about on another website and all these people all over the U.S. started sending him comics to help him rebuild his collection. And, and uh, it was a really nice story after Katrina. And I just gravitated towards him and got in touch with him early on because I wanted to definitely, you know, have somebody in the book who had lost everything, and then I was like, well, I can't resist having it be a, someone who lost all their comics, since I also am a collector or was a collector, and, you know, the comics can stand in for so many other things and any other um, scenario, so, and he was great, and, and um, he, uh, he, he didn't connect me with anybody else directly, but he did a really great thing, which was, so I was, I needed to do a ton of research, um, and I interviewed all these people, as I mentioned, and I even visited Denise, this one character who um, was at the um, convention center during all of the chaos right after the hurricane, who was really the most important character in the book, I would say. Um, but she had uh, evacuated up to Baton Rouge um, from New Orleans because her place was totally destroyed. And so I went up there to interview her. And there was another guy who had a store, a supermarket, a small, like a bodega type store. Um, that had also been uh, totally flooded out. And uh, I wasn't, when I went down to New Orleans the first time, I wasn't able to interview him um, at his store. I was able to interview him at his house, at his new location. So Leo, the comic book guy, he, knowing, knowing how comics are made and what kind of reference and resources I need, he on his own went over to the store, which had now been rebuilt, and took a whole row, like, 200 pictures for me from like every possible angle that you would need um, of the store. A exteriors, interiors, low shots, high shots, behind the counter, you know, all these different angles. And emailed them all to me and it was amazing. Yeah. And introduced himself to this other guy who he had no connection with other than they were both characters in my story. And it, it, actually all the, all the various characters, you know, like, that's what we, in the trade, we call our, our real people. <laughs> um, <laughs> They ended up all getting to know each other, and we did events together, like signings and, and media appearances together and stuff. So um, that was a really nice effect, you know, side effect of it, too. And we're, this is totally bizarre, but that store where um, Abbas had his, uh, that, that was, that, was um, that Leo did the research for me, that store ended up eventually, uh, Abbas reopened it after the, um, Hamid is his real name. He was called Abbas in the book. We can get into that too, talking about what Did fictionalization. Did you change the names of all the characters? One of the one of the characters' names was changed for the book, and one had been changed in the web version. And then when the when the book came out, he wanted his name changed back to his actual name. Yeah, I see. So, and I can explain why. But anyway, Hamid, the real guy, his store. He rebuilt it after the storm, very laboriously. Kept it open for another six, seven, eight years. Ended up closing it because it just wasn't really um, profitable, and uh, he had other things going on. And Leo, who now worked for a comic book store, opened up another uh, branch of the comic store uh -huh. in that old location. So, oh, so weird, yes. like weird connections. It's a weird, and uh, I'm assuming he would never useful. have known about the place if he hadn't gone for the yeah. purpose of AD to, to help me with the research on it. But yeah, I found people in various ways. Um, one was uh, the cousin of a really good friend of mine. One was... Um, had grad was at Oberlin College, which is where I graduated from, and um, was still a student there. And I had read about what happened to him in the Oberlin Alumni Magazine, so I contacted him. He was the one who was who wanted his name changed for the for the web version. And then once they saw that I had done a um, a responsible job of, of of telling their story, then said, "Okay, you know what? We me, me and my family would like you to change our names back to our real names when you publish it as a book." So there were some really nice stories that kind of came out of the whole process of making the book. Now, I mean, you among, I mean, you all have different approaches. I mean, but, I mean, you seem self-consciously more journalists. 
about, you know, and you've done other works of nonfiction too, including weren't you a, a, a fellow somewhere in journalism? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I was fortunate enough to win a journalism fellowship, mostly because of AD um, at, uh -huh. at the uh, University of Michigan um, a few years after the book came out. So I did a year of a, of a journalism. It was the first time they'd ever had a cartoonist or a long form cartoonist um, journalist uh, in that program. So that was pretty cool. Well, I, I've got another question, but I want to get the audience involved, so you can ask some questions too. But um, maybe just generally, uh, what, what do you see on the, on the landscape as nonfiction writers and different kinds of nonfiction? What I, I'd love to hear. What do you see about the? What do you see in the comics world today? And for me, that's that's it's that's a that's a couple of different things. That's the book trade. It's the comic shop market. It's the libraries, which I guess are really part of the book trade. But um, I'd love to hear your perspective. I could talk about mine and do often enough, but I'm not going to do it right now. I'll give you a chance. Um, let's jump back okay. to Mr. Baker. You've been on the scene for a while. Okay. Narrow, narrow the question down. Uh, how has the comics world changed between okay. your early days right. and early now day. that allows okay. a book like Nat Turner well, to survive? That's a majority. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, when, I, when I started in comics, Comics was the place you, you were passing through. Well, yeah. No, seriously, yeah. that's where you started your career. Right. We, we'd get out of college. I went to school of visual arts, mm -hmm. and yeah, I was on the advertising track or whatever. All the rich. Yeah, you're native New Yorker, movies. right? You're native New Yorker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, all the rich cartoons were in the newspaper at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so everybody at Mar Marvel, the old guys were like guys who had failed at advertising or failed. Yeah. Nobody wanted to be there. Yeah. And they, they, you know, you didn't have any movies or anything. Marvel was on the verge of bankruptcy all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people were getting their art back. And all it was just you got in and you you just put your portfolio together, and then you try to get into magazines or advertising mm -hmm. and all the other things that I ended up doing. And comic books were distributed at the candy store, the the, the newsstand. They were fifty cents each, and they, they used to tell us things like your your target market is kids. Make sure you got a lot of fights and stuff because a lot of that people can't read that are reading these. No, books. seriously. Yeah, I, I, I know you're no, not that's kidding. Funny that's funny. I know that's you're not kidding. I got into it. When I was five years old, I used to read that. That's important. Sure, that's me too. Oh, yeah, you got a lot of fights to make sure, you know, but they yeah. you know, always remember that your audience is children with 50 cents. And your shooter, Jim Shooter, was the boss at the time. Yeah. I mean, he always said, Your competition's a popsicle. He used to say, <laughs> You're you not your customer's a kid. His dad gave him a buck. He knows that he can play four Space Invaders, uh -huh. buy two candy bars, or buy for comics, and that's your competition, and, and that was where we were at. And there was one comic book collectible store in, in New York. It was called Super Snipe, and there was another one called the Comic Art Gallery. But it's a new thing, and we just, somebody discovered, wow, there's guys out there, grown men will pay $20, $30, $100 for an old X-Men comic, and we're here trying to suck 25 cents out of these kids, you know. And... Within ten years, suddenly it just—they just first they had tried to just do a couple of books for the kid for that mm -hmm. comic book market, and within a couple of years, because it's non returnable and because these people had deeper pockets than we expect, suddenly the whole thing flipped over, and, and you're within a few years, it's just we're only working for the comic stores. You know, you can't buy comic books anywhere anymore. You know, the drugstore, the bookstore, any of those. You know, and. This is the beginning of the direct market. Right. The comic so, shop market. So we all know. Yeah. You know, so this start, that started somewhere in the 1970s. Like, was it? Early 80s. Yeah. Yeah. The mm -hmm. uh, uh, first one, big one was Marvel Fanfare. Mm -hmm. And it was like a $3 book. It was big, big, you know. And it was just, But now, yeah, the average comic is like 20 bucks, and Yeah. And you can buy it and almost can, anywhere. Yeah. And uh, the, for me, the, the, uh, the big thing that changed was that I used to, when I first started, I was trying to, because I was doing stuff for magazines and things, I was always trying, just like you were doing with journalism, I was trying to do journalism comics in, like we did a, a thing about the OJ trial. We did like five yeah. page piece in uh, Vibe magazine. And those kind of things where I try to cover news stories yeah. or something like that. And it was this idea of trying to put comics into, and Neil Adams was doing the same thing, trying to get comics mm -hmm. into some other place that didn't normally have comics because comics was, mess. <laughs> As it, I, yeah. But like only in the last few years, and now it's changed because of the success of these movies and everything, mm -hmm. you know, and, 
and you're no longer in the book trade, right? I mean, you are in the book trade now. You know, at least you're self publishing. Yeah, but you know? I, I, that was a weird thing because I was, I got into that first because of uh, my first book was after Dark Knight and Mouse came out. Like they both came out the same year, and they were the first comic books to sell like a million copies. Mm-hmm. And Watchmen. I think it was like two two years later, but yeah, around the same time. Uh, and suddenly, all the other publishers. My first contract was with Doubleday. All the publishers were like, "We got to get a comic book," mm-hmm. you know. And so, I did my first book with Doubleday, and but nobody really knew what the hell they were doing. And yeah. stuff. <laughs> now, it, you know, it was growing pains. And then yeah. I quit comic books like everybody should. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was doing magazines and advertising yeah. and TV shows and stuff, and. When they finally had cracked the bookstores, I was one of the few people on earth who actually knew how to yeah. do a 150-page comic book yeah. <laughs> for that market. And so that's how I, I kind of got sucked back into it. And But it, it, I always joke that, that uh, comic books is my Bedford Falls. I'm always trying to get out, and I just keep getting... You get sucked back I in. I do. I get sucked back <laughs> in, you know. To a place where we were able to actually do something like this, you know, I think it's great. Yeah, I do too. Julia, so what about you? Yeah, um, I. I mean, you you kind of. I mean, you're at an age where it was kind of a different comic book world that you entered in. Right, I, I entered right? into enter, entered was birthed into um, a world in which it's a, it was a lot more mainstream. Certainly not as mainstream as it is now, mm-hmm. um, but you could. There were a couple, you know, um, when I was in college, you know, Mouse was a thing, Persepolis was a thing. So it was always a possibility as opposed to it, the genre just like starting to be created. But I still think that um, comics are still coming into uh, their own. Um, I think, uh, and I think about this a lot because I also work in film history. And I think that there's so much that is tying the two traditions of film and comics and that right now where we are in comics is where film was in the 1920s. But there was a ton of experimentation where in countries where that were, you know, capitalists that so they were trying to figure out a market for it, but then there were also monopolies. Um, and then in countries with, uh, that allowed for more experimentation, like the USSR, there was a lot of really new stuff that was going on. Um, and so I think there's still possibility for a lot of experimentation. And what nonfiction comics are are basically documentary comics, mm-hmm. right? And documentaries started in the early 20s. So that's is another reason where I feel like like this is still such an era where the, the, no one has really defined the form yet. And it's a really interesting time to think about what comics are because right now the possibilities, there maybe they're not endless, but there's so much more that can be done with how things are laid out on a page um, what the, 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 even the, um, the three dimensional aspect of the book, like Anders Nielsen with his like accordion books, you know, there's so mm-hmm. much more yes. that can be done with, with page layouts that, that I'm really excited to see where things are going. But I also feel like something, something needs to change, you know, in the way that the distribution market works where a cartoonist, I don't think we're paid enough. Um, I, the way that the market works, it favors the distributor. Uh, it does not favor small independent publishing. Um, there's not enough room for experimentation. Um, I have uh, had a lot of pitfalls. It's really hard to get people to know about my book because it's an independent press. Um, it's, they're not the first books that people see on a, a long list, so very few people know about it. And um, the people that know about it really enjoy it and like it and tell their friends. So a lot of the success of the book, um, and I was lucky because it sold out of its first print run within five months, and then it's in its second printing. Um, but so much of it has been going to festivals and marketing my own marketing and like word of mouth and um, contacting people directly. Like this is, I, there's so much work that I have to do to just get like a couple hundred dollars half, every half year. You know, it's I can't pay rent with that. That's why I'm a teacher. You know, and. Um, but it takes so much time. Like, I don't know when the next time I'll even have enough time to write a book like this because I have to make rent somehow. So um, I think something needs to change unless, you you know, the same um, people that want to. If the, only, the, only, the way that the market works now is that only people with connections um, or that um, fill a certain niche in a very specific time or um, who have other routes to get agents and things like that where... There, you have to like do your time, and then you can be, you know, get uh, that that kind of 
you know, distribution with your book, but it's, I think it's increasingly become likely that it's people with their own independent wealth, or it's their own other careers, or it's so, there's some other way to finance your life. You know, I think it's been really difficult. Um, well, and feel like something needs to change. <laughs> well, the life of an artist is a difficult life. Uh, but uh, that you, you, you end on a good point. Uh, yet and still, we've seen a huge transformation in this market. It's a lot more easier. You still won't be able to pay the bills. But there's, it's a new world as far as getting different kinds of books of, into, the, into the American book market. When I was a kid, when you were a kid, a cartoonist had two, maybe three options. You either work for superheroes, you did gag panels, and you tried to get syndicated news trip. And that was pretty much it. And it's all run by the mom. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Literally. Uh, it's a different world now. Um, Self-publishing uh, has changed all of publishing, not just comics publishing. Crowdfunding has also transformed uh, the options that are available to artists. But Josh... Well, what do you think in your time in comics? I'm sorry, I Josh has got to talk to you, and then we'll come okay. back to you. We are not okay. done yet, and then we'll go. Okay. Don't, don't forget. You want to write it down? But give Josh a, ch a shot. Yeah. What are, how, how have things changed, and, and what's your perspective on the market now? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, my experiences mirror Kyle's. Um, we're probably around the same generation, but... Um, they went a different direction because I early on kind of recognized that I didn't have the skill set to to make it in the corporate comics world. Like I just couldn't draw superheroes. I kind of lost interest in the genre as a reader and as as a creator at a certain point. And I discovered, you know, indie comics and black and white comics. And um, uh, Harvey Picar particularly was a really big influence on me. And I worked as an illustrator for him for American Splendor for a long time. And I really admired the fact that he just kept putting out this comic book year after year. He didn't about his he, life. About his life. Um, it was very mundane. Ordinary life is complex. Is pretty complex stuff, as he likes to say. Um, and uh, he he defiantly was going on this alternative route. It was not about making a career as a cartoonist. Um, and um, I identified with that. And you know, I had other skills. So I did illustration. I did graphic design. I did web design when the web started up. And I always found other ways to make a living. And 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 my passion, my hobby was making comics. And I just kept doing it. And um, I did self publishing. I did mini comics. I traded them on Fact Sheet Five and and uh, uh, at small comic festivals when those started up in the '90s. And um, got a small publisher, you know, and then kind of kept going up the ranks. But even with the small publishers, I was still doing most of the production and, and certainly the marketing and all that stuff on my own. So I was also developing those skills uh, further of, of being a publisher, in a sense, in essence. And then uh, AD hit, and that was just total luck. And, and, you know, weirdly, the market, the comics world changed around me, and I happened to ride on that wave. Like, I was defiantly doing nonfiction, not commercial stuff, when that was n what was not going to get me anywhere. But I just kept doing it. And then, weirdly, like people started wanting that stuff. <laughs> and and um, AD happened, and then the influencing machine, and then um, my fellowship. And, and uh, now, I, now I'm teaching as well. And um, my wife has a full-time job. And somehow we put all of this together. You know, I'm a professional cartoonist now, and I don't know how it happened. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, it was definitely not like the way um, I ever expected it to play out, but when you look back backwards, it all kind of makes sense that it went this way. But um, yeah, I mean, there's it, it. It's true that it's it's not. It's my mom was an artist. My mom is still an artist. I grew up uh, as a as a only child in a single um, family household of a mother who was a struggling artist, and we were on welfare. We tra we lived in group houses. We did traveled all over the place. Like I knew what the life of an artist was like. I had no uh, uh, illusions, you know, about like w the riches and glory that were awaiting me, and I was I was fine with that. Um, and so I've been, I, you know, I, 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 it's just stubbornness. Like the only reason <laughs> people like us still are making comics is because we just have to make them, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether people yeah. buy them or not, you know. And uh, I, I guess in the process, there are there the are much more has, venues now yeah. for it. Yeah. In the process, the landscape has changed. It ain't perfect, anyway. Now you had a, a point to make, and then I want to get some questions yeah, yeah. from the audience. Well, what I was thinking, 
I, I live in, uh, right now I'm living in Forest Hills. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh right, Shea yeah. Stadium. Okay. Yeah. That entire neighborhood, everybody's old, everybody's Jewish, and everybody's Russian. You know that neighborhood, that area? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. all the signs are in Russian and kosher and whatever. Park? Yeah, right by yeah, the yeah, park. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> see? I, I spend all my time picking up old ladies off the sidewalk. <laughs> I'm the youngest guy in the neighborhood. But the point is, <laughs> The point is, uh, what I found is, is because of the internet, you can reach whatever, whoever you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have certain interests, like yeah, I have a handicapped family member. There's a network of people with that handicap that you can you can reach them right away. Or, yes. Like I say, if you want to talk to old Russians, you can reach the old Russians. So, I don't know about the internet. I'm just saying I know where they are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He, was, he can no, find I'm saying if I, Yeah. You know, uh, uh, my, what I'm saying is that if you do say, whatever, uh, flowers, I, I'm yeah. working on something. My kids are in roller derby right now. So I've been doing roller derby cartoons. And there's a roller derby community out there. I don't mm -hmm. know if they hang out in the comic stores or whatever, but there's a roller derby community. And you can reach those people. You get a list of people sure. who sell roller skates and have roller derbies. And you can just... It's easier now to do something like that. You know, you, I don't think it, it doesn't matter if people can't get in the comic store. You know, I agree. I like this is dying. There's a horrible death in the comic store. Of course. And I knew that. Going the comic book store is like right. good well, for some things. But as I said, I knew. It's, it's changing, though. Well, it, it, okay. the, even the comic book stores are changing. I don't want to trash the, comic book stores. Time when I came <laughs> too much, idea, anyway. Yeah. As I said, the only people I knew who were interested were black people. Like I said, I was talking to everybody. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes, yeah, whatever, whatever. But then black people went, oh, and gosh, if somebody made an turn and like, I'd totally buy that for my kid. There you, just, go. you hear that a hundred times, you're like, well, I know where black people hang out. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I know how to reach black people. There's sure. ways to do it. And, and I think it's easier now than ever. Absolutely. So the I've done more publishing is because what I find is everybody you work with, they have their network. So if I'm working with DC Comics or Marvel mm -hmm. Comics, which I still do, and I'm doing a Black Panther comic book, and they know exactly where to put that that the people are going to buy, and they know how to sell the Black Panther dolls and the toys and the da da da, or the Wonder Woman dolls or whatever. Something like this, I knew I could sell it. Like, first place we talked it up was at churches. Mm -hmm. Black people love some church. Yes. And so we went to we'd do these talks at like Sunday schools mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and yeah. the black churches. And my thing was just, if I'm doing the light work, what I had found at, at Marvel at or any publisher I had, was, mm -hmm. I could not figure out what they were doing for their 80%. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, That's a very good, thing with, very good and question. And I'll stop because I can monopolize it. <laughs> but right now, the last time I checked, you know this better than me. Last time I heard, Amazon was 80% of the book market. I don't know if they're eighty percent, but they're okay, they're big. I heard, there, were, there was a time when, when the bookstores were all going down because I was right. selling to Virgin Mega Store, Tower, right. and all these places just vanished. And then we all had to like find new places like Target. That would... They're probably seventy or eighty percent right. of the ebook market. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. But what I found is in the comics, for example, there's one distributor. Yeah. So right. it's like, well, gee, then that means there's one. No matter who you sign up with, you're going to make one phone call. Yeah. And you'd probably make that phone call. And it's the same thing. You know, if I get my book on Amazon, that's a big chunk of the market. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I still do want to get onto Google yeah. Play or iTunes or whatever, but yeah, it's just not, Yeah. They, they, it's very little that they, in my opinion, they bring to the park. Yeah. Well, so. the publishing side. Well, that's true. But anyway, let's get some questions. Great. <laughs> All right. Let's hear it. Uh, I have a question for, uh, oh. For the three of you that's uh, process related, really, um, you guys have been doing comics for decades. And as you began, huh? Well, anyway, doing comic books, it used to be like a 25, 32 page endeavor. These days, it's anywhere from 150 to 300 or more. So I'm just wondering how you deal with uh, trying to put out the best quality work you can without sacrificing. You know, because you have to put out a lot more pages, and yet you don't want the work to suffer. So I was wondering how long it takes you to get books done, and also how you go about doing that. Um, well, I 
haven't been doing comics for decades, as I'm only a few decades old, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but I've been, I, I would say, about a, a decade of at least comics making in some way. And um, I take a long, a long time with each page. I stick to a schedule, and um, one page would, out of like a, two, you know, the first draft of the book was over 220 pages, and one page took one day of just drawing, um, about half a day of sketching it out beforehand, and then a day of, of, of scanning it and putting it in Photoshop. And so it's, it's really time consuming. So multiply that by, you know, 220, and that's quite a lot of days. I mean, each of these are full nine to five days. Um, so, uh, it's, it's tough. It, I think comics take so much longer than, um, than print, and I've worked in print too, uh, and it it's a, a fact that and that it just takes longer, and um, it makes. How it long did it take for you to get your book done? Uh, a year and a half, and this and this is I did not have another job. Like I I took a chunk of time that I saved up money for, and I knew I would not do any other work. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without that time. Um, so, you know, without something like a fellowship, which is wonderful, or something like that, uh, I don't think a, a, a book with, at least I would not be able to do it without all of the uh, emotional and time commitments that would go into making a book of, the, of, of all of these lengths, I think. I think it's all of these stories are things that, that require a lot of emotional energy, you know, and make it difficult to run. Yeah, you're nodding. So, yeah, making it very difficult to run from one project to the other require a lot of continuity, um, which is something that's always more difficult with a long-form book versus a mini-comic where you can, you know, have a set time to finish it and then move on to something else. It has to have formal continuity, too. The pages can't look that different. You know, what happens if you start a book and then you come back to it a year later and then your style totally changes? You know, so there has to be a lot of visual continuity there, too. Um, and that's something that requires a ton of consistent emotional and like actual physical labor. Um, and I, it, without having the time and money to have the time, I don't think it could be done. So I was lucky that I was able to save up enough money to sustain myself and didn't have any other extraneous expenses. Um, but it is difficult and don't think I, I, I would not personally be able to do it jumping from one thing to another. Could I just add a facet to your question, and, and because I think it's a, and I think it's a very good question, I think the kinds of stories, and the length of the stories, the depth of the stories that we're seeing in comics is changing because we're in a new world of comics, and there are different kinds of stories that need to be told, and they're not always being told because, oh, you know, you used to be able to do 25 pages for Marvel or DC, because there's a whole other world that's available to storytellers. That's I, I just wanted to add that. Uh, if that helps you answer the question. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I second a lot of what Julia just said. I, I think uh, having a process that you depend on and can rely on, like, really helps to set markers. And I've never done a monthly book or anything like that. I never had to worry about that. So I wouldn't, and I wouldn't be able to because I'm not Jack Kirby who could, like, pencil 12, 12 pages over a weekend or whatever. Um, but, uh, um, you know, my process for AD was it was deadline based. I, I was doing the bulk of the book was literally on a monthly schedule, and I had to do the researching, the reporting, the writing, the drawing, all uh, it, within that month period, so it could be posted online. And I, I would say probably that wasn't you know it was it, in the in the in the web version it might have been a 20, 20 pages, but it was a lot less than that because the way the the page is is uh, decided on the web is different than what it is on print mostly because of the orientation of the screen versus the orientation of a page. Um, so basically, it was half a page, uh, one page of, of the web was like half a page of the, com the final comic. But um, still, it was a lot of work, but I, you know, I, I got a process down. I, I'm a very, I don't know how you guys work, but I write a full script out for myself based on all this research, and I use this program called um, Scrivener to, to get, contain all my research and all my notes in various versions and drafts, and I can paste back and forth, and I create this very detailed uh, DC style, um, DC house style script, you know, that literally says page one, panel one, the character sitting in front of their house reading the computer to see the weather tracking. Leo, look, the, you know, storm is coming. Michelle in the background, you know, it's like all sound effects. Everything is like totally um, delineated. And then I can sit down 
and draw and do layouts and draw from that and even have other things going on in the background because I've already done like the heavy thinking um, at that point so I can have like the rest of my life going on in a sense while I'm drawing and my studio's in my living room, I have a, uh, I have a, a daughter and my wife is there, you know, everything's kind of happening but I just kept pushing through it, I was doing other jobs at the same time and then when, um, so that was two years doing that project like that and then I got the book deal and I had to produce this other material and, and fine tune all the other work I had done um, and at that point, I had the luxury of having an advance to at least pay f pay back some of the <laughs> the money I'd lost the, over the previous two years, and and finance me working and finishing up the the book. And by the time that money was was gone, the book came out, and then I moved right on to the next book and got a smaller advance for that one. But at least it was enough to enable me to keep going in that same method. But then that book took two years. It took a year longer than I thought it was gonna than it was gonna take. And that was really, that was bad news for me. And I, I missed family holidays. I, I was drawing over New Year's Eve when my family was... And how many pages there. was that book? Uh, that's like, uh, oh, geez, like 100, 180 pages or something. AD is like 180. I think the influencing machine was 150 or something. But um, for me, that was very fast because I had deadlines. Like that's what makes me stick to a schedule is deadlines. And we were talking about this earlier, you know, we're always searching for ways to speed up our processes, but uh, Julie and I are both uh, very connected to uh, analog materials and like drawing on paper with pen and ink and brushes and all that stuff, and that definitely is, is probably not strategically the best decision, but it's such a, a passionate, a matter, you know, a matter of personal um, attachment, but I do want to lose that and... and and start to work more digitally because I'm sure it'll speed up my process. And Kyle was talking about how he's he moved it totally digital and loves it and can do all sorts of well. You, I'm not going <laughs> to paraphrase what you could say, but anyway, that's a big that's a big debate going on in the comics industry is how digital production can speed up um, people's processes. Yeah, you, that, yeah, response. And maybe we get one more question in uh, after okay. Kyle answers. Yeah, what well, I, I I have to kind of strike a balance because. Uh, things like Nat Turner, like I said, it, it's it's working out now. I finally just this year, or last year, got my first royalty check for that book. And I think it's been like ten years or something like that. No, I, uh, but but I also got a job. I just recently did a, a job for the uh, Josiah Henson Park, which came directly from that. So when I do something like that, I know that it's a direction I want to move it. Uh, again, nobody would have ever called me for anything based on. Batman, you're not going to say, oh, I love your Batman book, why don't you do a book for Josiah Henson Park, right. you know, and uh, like this week I'm doing a, an animated film uh, for a film festival, I, that's one of these long-term things I've been working on is, is my films, my animation, and, but then I also balance it with my DC Comics job, which is just, you know, steady, and that just gets done to get done, I mean, it, it's got a monthly deadline, and it is what it is, and uh, the nice thing about the DC stuff or, or the corporate stuff is it's it, a lot of the, the creative decisions are out of your hand. You know? Yeah, because uh, you have to... Yeah, if somebody says, God here's God. what Phineas and Ferb is about, yeah. here's how long it is, here's how many, and here's what's going to happen, and then you bring the script in and they change it all. And you, no, that's, I'm, I'm saying... I know, I know but that's fine, and, and you, the, the only reason I do something like that is for the check, or the only reason, yeah. you know, like I say, the only reason I'll do Spider-Man is for the check, and I so I don't get into these big arguments about... Yeah. You know, but Nat Turner, like, I wasn't going to change it. But that, I knew, or, like, the film I'm working on right now, those 10 years from now are going to sustain me. No, but no, uh, you know, when I do something like Deadpool, and I'm not complaining because I, I signed a contract. I'm not one of these guys who signs a contract and then complains about the contract. But you know going in yeah. that you are not going to get paid for the T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky, you can get a free T-shirt. But, but you need to do those just to get them done, you know, to So let's get, get one more question in, because we think we have to bring this lovely evening to a close. So get, uh, one more question. Yes, right. Um, this is a second part question to the process. Um, with the scripts, do all of you use a script, or how does it work with your words and pictures? Yeah, I also used a script, and like like Josh, I also had the whole script written out before um, before starting the book. Um, I, I mean, I was lucky in the sense that I had my great grandmother's memoir. So, what much of the job of writing the script was editing, you know, 
to pick the 5% or the 4%, you know, out of this wealth of material that I had. She had like 60 pages, what it ended up being in when I, you know, wrote it in Word, 60 pages, single space, like 10 point font. So I had to find, you know, like a very specific amount. Um, but I, I, I don't do as, as detailed scripts as, as you do with the exactly what happens in each panel. Um, I decide that later on, I basically have an idea of a chapter and I, you know, have a sense of like, this is between five and eight pages per chapter. Um, and then I divide it from there. So it's all about the dialogue and the, um, you know, whatever you know, other text commentary goes in there. Um, but I don't provide that much other, you know, most of the figuring out what's happening on each page happens much later for me, but the script always comes first. Yeah. I, I do all the drawings first, and and then I write, because I, I believe that... Isn't that like the Marvel technique or something? Well, that's probably where I picked it up. Also, Charles Schultz used to do it, Walt Disney used to do it. The idea, we're selling pictures. I mean, you could buy, you could buy a novel or, or a nonfiction book about Nat Turner, but... You're, you're buying pictures, so I want to make sure. I've written, like the first couple of books I did, I wrote a script first. And what happens is you, you, you'll you have a scene where it's like two people talking in a kitchen, and then when you sit down to draw, you're like, oh my God, I just, yeah, I got 10 people, 10 pages of people sitting in chairs. Like, this would be terrible, a terrible comic book. No, you know what I'm saying? It's just not, you know, so I always just try to make sure I got some kind of interesting way to, and also you want to use other tools at your disposal. When you're when you're a writer, you only have the words. So I, I, one thing I like that you were saying is that you, you go for the emotion, which is the main thing I go for. I don't care about the story. I don't care about anything. I, I really think you think about the emotion. You'll come out of a movie and you're you'll, you'll a lot of time, like Hitchcock movies. I, I get all wound up and then I come out of the movie and they're like, "What was that movie about?" I, I couldn't tell you, but I know that I, I was really upset when Cary Grant was getting chased by chased by an airplane. But you come out and you're like, "Why is Cary Grant getting chased by an airplane?" It make any so, uh, if you can, if you start with the drawing, say, uh, like I just had to do a, a for this park, uh, uh, somebody who's being, I can't remember, oh, yeah, the slaves weren't allowed to read, so this guy was reading secretly, and then the guy finds him, and then he's going to whip him, but I chose this, like, low camera angle, so that the character was, like, very small in the background, and there's, like, a big hand with a whip in the foreground, and, and it's the layout and the, the lighting that create a tension before you even know what's going on. You're like, oh, the character is very small and frightened looking, you know, and there's this big shadowy hand. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's something like this. I, like, a, this is one of my favorite covers ever uh, that I've done. Because I, I just think it, 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 it works. It says it all. It works. It says it all. Yeah. Well, look, we're going to have to wind this down on this note. Yeah, can we have a big round of applause for our three <laughs> terrific panelists? Um, thanks so much to the Society of Illustrators for holding this panel. Thank you so much to Calvin and Josh, Julia, and Kyle. We're going to.